Hello, everyone at home. Um, my name is Kelsey Dillo. I'm the gallery manager here at Aramont School of Arts and Crafts. Uh, welcome to our instructor roundtable series. So this series aims to highlight the talented artists who were supposed to teach here at Aramont um, in 2020. It introduces new ideas in contemporary craft, and we hope to strengthen the connections within our own community. So check out the 2020 instructor ex exhibition on our website for more information about our instructors and their work. I want to remind the guests at home that while they, they will be muted during their chat today, we will encourage you to post any questions that you might have in the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. We're gonna do our best to get to as many of these as we can towards the end of our conversation today. Um, more information about our panelists will be shared in the chat bar, and today's discussion will be recorded and posted on our website and YouTube channel later this week. So today we're talking with three artists whose work relates to the theme of lost and found. Our panel today includes Nick DeFord, fiber artist, educator, and director of programs here at Aramont, Julia Gartrell, sculptor, founder of Radical Repair Workshop and educator based in Durham, North Carolina, and Billy Rankel, mixed media artist and illustrator based in Clarksville, Tennessee. Um, I'm also really pleased to welcome our very first guest moderator, Heinrich Tome. Heinrich is a printmaker based in Kansas City, Missouri. He was instrumental in helping us start this series, and he participated in the first conversation back in July on identity. Thank you so much for being here, Heinrich. I'm gonna turn it over to you now. Thanks for having me on as your um, guest moderator, and thanks everyone for joining us. I think, briefly, when we first started talking about um, <clears throat> having you know, a platform for for us to feel, um, you know, connected back to Aramon uh, when when this when the pandemic first started, and I, I think the uh, roundtable has provided a, a great platform for all of us to to reconnect again. And there is nothing more exciting than instructors asking other instructors questions. So I'm going to jump right to it. Uh, I'm going to start with a, a one of my favorite quotes, actually. Uh, that goes, beauty should be shared for it enhances our joys. To explore its mystery is to venture towards the sublime. And that's a quote by Joseph Connell. Um, so as artists who use found objects in your work, I'm for one um, intrigue by the subject matter of lost and found. What is gonna happen is we will do introductions for you guys, starting with Nick, um, Julia and Billy, and we will start with your five minute introduction and I will hand it over to Nick. Sure, thanks Heinrich. Um, and yeah, I, I'm really pleased to be here today and have this conversation, you know, I. Uh, you know, again, full disclosure, wasn't teaching next uh, this past summer as, as a program director. I would have been in Aramont helping facilitate things, but it's really a pleasure to talk with uh, about my work with all these artists that I really admire their work. Um, so it's it's interesting. I, I, I'm really pleased to be a part of this conversation because I talk about using found materials in my in in my artist lectures so often. But because I'm, you know, primarily known for my embroidery, typically I spend a lot of time talking about embroidery and stitching more than the the act of um, reusing materials. But really, that's my interest. You know, I, it started with um, I always said this that I was actually a drawing major when I was an undergrad, but I had a lot of sculpture envy. Um, I was taking sculpture classes and really, like midway through, wanted to switch over to be a sculpture major. But I had a um, uh, advisor tell me, you know, you're getting your BFA in art, you're not necessarily getting your BFA in, in a particular medium, just why don't you just draw like you would make sculptures. And why I was jealous of sort of sculpture majors at the time is because I had some really great instructors who encouraged the students to make sculpture out of whatever they find. Things on the side of the highway that you stop and pick up or or digging through through you know the trash or going to thrift stores and for me that provided that that use of material and materiality provided a lot more resonance 
than my sort of drawing kit and pencils and things like that. And so I was always attracted to finding ways to use as many different materials as I possibly could, and specifically to, to reuse materials. And, and most of the things I think that you'll see today in the short little slideshow that I, that of my work is that all of my surfaces that I stitch into, they aren't blank surfaces. They're, um, there's something else first. You know, I, I, I'm not the type of artist who starts with a blank page. I start with some information. In fact, I see myself as somebody who pushes information around um, more so than I, I create information. I, I, um, I cover, like in this case, like taking the figure and stitching over it. You know, I obscure, I, I, I manipulate. Um, you know, and, and, and again, those are kind of words that I feel like are often used in sculptural practices. Like I like to form my images as, as I use them. And for me, stitching is a really good way to do that because stitching is a mark that it doesn't just sit on the surface. It really permeates the surface. It becomes the surface. It becomes the object. You know, these stitches become part of, of, of the ground that they're on and they're, you can't erase it, you know, without destroying the surface. It, it's, they're sort of intertwined together. Um, I, I know we're going to talk about this a lot more, but all of my images, all, you know, all of my, my forms um, are coming from things that I find at thrift stores, things that are donated to me. Um, I think, uh, I don't, I think Deborah might be controlling the, go to the next slide if you can. Oh yeah. So I started, uh, a lot of it was paper products because paper is easy to em embroider into. Um, but I wanted to challenge myself and I, did, I started a series probably about four or five years ago where I wanted to stitch into game boards. Um, and uh, that requires a slowing down of the process. So I would have to pre-puncture the holes um, uh, before I stitch into them. Um, and collecting game boards is something really easy to do from thrift stores and other places. You just, you just go around and you, and you find these things. In fact, after a while, people just start giving you game boards. I've, I've come home before and there'll just be uh, antique games sitting on my porch and I don't know who they're from. You know, after a while, when people know that you like to, to, to collect these things, you don't even have to go out and look for them. People uh, give them to you. Um, you know, and I, when I embellish these surfaces, even though I might be using thread and, 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 and sequins and other things that are uh, maybe store-bought, maybe not things that are found or thrifted, uh, still a lot of it is stuff that's been donated to me. Um, people who are getting rid of old embroidery kits or, or thread collections or sequin collections um, often give me uh, uh, their their objects. And I, I really, really, and I know we'll talk about this more, I, I think, as we have a conversation, and especially when we hear more from Julia and Billy, but I really like using materials that are inexpensive. And I think not only inexpensive, but um, kind of the underdogs, right? The, the, the materials that are, are, are sort of maybe sometimes pushed aside as being um, not high art or not necessarily materials that are special. So like costume jewelry, used thread, plastic sequins. I like to kind of elevate that a little bit. So that's a little brief introduction about my work. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to this conversation. So I'll pass it over to the next person. I think that's me. Thank you, Nick. Um, I just want to say thanks. I love this program. Um, I love Aramont. I'm a kind of long-term uh, Aramont groupie. So it's really nice to see how nimble y'all have been in the face of the pandemic and providing online programming. Um, so I'm just gonna give a brief overview kind of of my practice thinking of it through how I became such a found object person. Um, and that really started pretty young. I grew up um, in Durham, North Carolina, where there's a, a nonprofit called the Scrap Exchange, which the, the goal of that nonprofit is to take clean industrial discards, salvage them from going into waste streams, and resell them to the public. Um, and I really cut my teeth there on just learning A, about industrial process and how much waste is involved, but also just at the possibilities and sort of the strangeness and the um, really whimsical nature of some of these um, objects that people would discard. Um, so that would be like 
foam that was supposed to line like our new airport that all the cutoffs from that or like the cutoffs from the hosiery factories um, in rural North Carolina or there was a parachute company. So you're getting your hands on all these interesting materials that are kind of like waste. Um, so I worked there as a teenager and then returned to working there um, in a managerial position after college. Um, so I really became obsessed with salvaging material because they're also collecting household goods like bottle caps and um, you know real truly whatever if you're ever in Durham it's a great place to check out um, so I went into college thinking like I'm I'm gonna look at big picture waste I'm really interested in manufacturing and production and um, I was making all this stuff that was trying to tell a very specific story through a very broad lens um, which you know was more or less feasible and functional, but um, I really had a turning point um, kind of years later in grad school when I realized I needed to switch the narrative and start telling personal stories through objects that would convey a larger, um, larger message. So that came in the form of really researching into family history, regional history, Southern vernacular architecture, craft history, which I really got to dig into when I was a resident at Aramont, um, and using really, really particular stories to tell um, kind of larger themes. And a lot of that has to do in my practice with making do, um, I don't really like this term, but upcycling, if you will, but I, I prefer to call it like rejecting functional fixedness, if you will. Um, but thinking about, you know, how has ingenuity in materials come from scarcity, come from being a living in a rural way, which a lot of my kind of past relatives were? And how are you using materials that maybe you ha are using out of necessity to make something um, just work? And so my work, as you can see through these images, takes it a little bit less literally and more into a sculptural realm. Um, and in grad school, I was in New England and um, really kind of missing home. And so I started bringing up really things that were really specific to the South. So in my case, it was this bright red clay that I was digging up and slapping on sculptures. And, you know, just thinking about how like transporting an object or transporting a material can kind of change its meaning as well. Um, and then, you know, I started residency hopping as a lot of people do after grad school. I ended up at Aramont, which was wonderful. And really got to learn some craft practice. So this is, for example, a huge weird basket woven off of my hiking boot that I'd had for 15 years or something ridiculous. Um, and so I was able to combine all these um, craft and historical practices into my love of object making. Um, and I echo Nick that I'm kind of pro underdog object. Like I like to take things that are cheap or just easily discarded and kind of elevate them. Um, and uh, it's about, I'm about to run out of time, but I will also say this has turned into this traveling workshop called the Radical Repair Workshop, which I'm sure I'll elaborate on a little bit more, but taking all these ideas and putting them into a teaching context was also really important to me because um, I consider my practice really driven by also being an educator. Um, and with that, I'll leave you with a little cliffhanger, but um, we'll move on to Billy. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Uh, I, I also want to uh, uh, say how glad I am to be here and involved in such an interesting conversation. Um, uh, I'm, I'm going to talk just briefly about sort of two revelations that led me to working with not, not so much found objects because I, I don't think spatially uh, very successfully, um, but found images which I think of as functioning like objects. Um, and uh, 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 I, I am interested in uh, the way that those images um, might generate new information by uh, bringing their previous life to some some kind of a, a new context. Um, uh, both uh, Julia and Nick have talked about um, being interested in sort of underdog materials, and I hadn't thought about it that way, but I but of course I am. Um, I have thought about it as um, materials that um, had had a previous use that was no longer necessary. So they were sort of looking for a new job to do. Uh, like somebody who was forced into retirement early and 
uh, real, you know, realizes that they have a, you know, a, a lot of life left, um, uh, like pro productivity left. And so they have to find a new thing to do with what they know. Um, I, I sort of think of uh, works as doing that. Um, this image it, is uh, emblematic of my first kind of aha experience, which was also in college, um, like Nick talked about. Um, I, I went to Auburn University where I feel like I got a, a really brilliant education. And in one semester, in the same semester, I was taking an, a, a survey of art history and I was taking uh, um, intro to uh, anatomy and physiology. And I, you know, it sort of slowly dawned on me that my fellow students in those two classes were using the images in our textbook in a really different way. Um, the art students were looking in a, in a sort of cursory way you know, at a cathedral trying to figure out like what's the minimum they had to know about it to be able to recognize it on a slide test. Um, whereas my, my colleagues in anatomy and physiology were, like were, if they needed to learn the Krebs cycle, were like studying that with incredible intensity. And, and it seemed like there was a, like a little bit of a different sense of uh, authority from those two kinds of images. And I, and I was interested in that. And, and I started to work with um, uh, using found images, uh, I would combine them a lot of times from science, uh, and that combination, that collage, would be the sketch, and then I would make a conventional drawing or mixed media work based on the sketch. Um, and I, I thought of myself as sort of bringing some of the authority from those science images um, it, into art. Um, and I didn't show the collages. Um, uh, I just showed the work I made from the collages. Um, and then my, my second epiphany, um, I was sort of a late bloomer, so it didn't happen until a long time after college. Um, I was in Switzerland in a residency in a little town where no one spoke English uh, beside me. So I spent a, a lot of time alone. Um, and I did uh, a collage, I did this collage on the left, um, and it's made of quarter inch sections of um, maps of the Swiss Alps from, uh, a Swiss middle school atlas that I, I bought at a junk store. Um, I, was, I was interested, I was thinking a lot about how the Swiss really identified with the Alps. Um, and I was also reading Rilke, and I don't remember the poem now, but he, but he talks about his heart, um, you know, as a place. And I, you know, and I thought about, you know, how much the Alps seemed like the heart of Switzerland and that, that I could make this heart out of the Alps um, by cutting up the, the middle school atlas. And um, something about being away, um, it's, it is probably not accidental that it's a heart because it was also that six months away when I, I, I realized I never wanted to be away from the, the woman who would be my wife uh, when I got home. Um, and so, um, uh, so that's probably wound up in my response to this image. But anyway, I realized that the collages maybe were more interesting than the drawings I was making from the collages and I could just stop. Uh, with the drawing and uh, focus on the collages instead. And um, uh, ever since then, I, I really, uh, you know, that was, uh, not, you know, 25 years ago, I, I, I really haven't done anything um, that involved generating a, a new image. Um, uh, like, like Nick said, I, I, I think of myself as pushing images or pushing information around um, uh, part of it, I think, is that it just feels like such hubris to imagine that I could make something new. Um, like I'm like that sort of seems like a fiction anyway. Um, uh, but but I mean, maybe there are super brilliant people who make new things, but I'm not one of those people. And there are already so many great images around that uh, like it seems more efficient to collaborate with those images. Uh, than, than to feel like, um, uh, you know, that sort of the peril of facing a blank surface. Um, so uh, I think I, I think I'll stop there, and uh, uh, we'll continue the conversation. That's fascinating. Hearing all of you have a very interesting approach. Simply looking at, at materials and materiality. Now, you know, I experience whether, you know, as an artist myself, when, when I'm sourcing for material, you know, whether it's a surplus store, a, a hardware store, an antique mall, you know, a thrift store, uh, 
where everyday objects are potentially uh, future art materials. So it's a very different perspective when we walk in somewhere and our mind tells us, like it or not, I'm shopping for my next project. You know, we walk in there and we see things so differently. And the thrill of finding just the right object is like the discovery of treasure. Um, do share what your approach to your own found object is. And specifically, if and what are your own criteria you have in place when you are looking at a potential material? Um, do you seek them out or do you discover that they find you? Um, and you're going to go back to Nick. And also, Nick, what is your most memorable memory of being lost? You know, it's, 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 it's interesting. I mean, that's a, I think what you brought up, Heinrich, is a really sort of a crux of, of the question is, I think for people who feel like they need to go pick up their art supplies from the art supply store, and not that there's anything wrong with that, but already you know you're going in to, 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 to get this specific thing, like having a grocery list uh, versus going into the grocery store and just kind of picking up what you want when you want to. Um, you know, I've, it's such a different experience because I, I, I do go to the art store to get things that I need, usually to complete a project, some, to, 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 to solve some specific goal. Well, maybe that's a good way to put it. Um, a lot of the times when I find something that responds to me in a thrift store or something, it's a question, right? The thing presents a question to me that I need to solve. It's a puzzle. I love puzzles. I love games. And I feel like that when I'm interacting and I think, um, you know, Billy said it really well, it's just a collaborative experience that you're working with this material that already has this past story, that it's that puzzle, that moment of question of, I don't know how I'm gonna solve this. That's when I feel lost and that feels great. Like that feeling of feeling lost is great. Once you, yeah, once you solve the puzzle, like eh, it's done, you know, like you move on to the next puzzle. You don't go back and you don't do the same crossword every day. You want the next crossword puzzle. Um, and so for me, I, you know, when I'm, when I'm, when I have that experience of uh, somebody asked me a riddle, maybe a riddle is a better way to put it than a, than, a, than a puzzle or a question. When I come across a material or an, an image or an object, it's a riddle that might not get solved for years. I mean, I'm sure Julia and Billy can say the same thing. I, I, I find things that I don't use immediately. Like I put it up on the wall and sometimes it never gets used because the object is already so great. I'm like, I don't really think I can do anything to make this object any better. I have maps in ephemera and things that I don't know if I'm ever going to touch because I can't, that's a riddle that I can't solve that riddle. That's a completely like Lewis Carroll style enigma that is just fine being an enigma on its own. So, you know, I'll, I'll pass it over to Billy and Julia to maybe bounce off that idea a little bit. Well, some things are already too good and they don't need anything else. I've found so many, like what comes to mind is this, I found this rope, I would, when I was living in Provincetown, I was like sourcing a lot of nautical stuff. And I found this rope that had been on the ground, like in the seasons for clearly like a long time. And it had grown all this, um, these, this root structure into it. And I just felt like I found the sculpture. Like I really didn't have to do anything to it. So there's like the ones that are the enigmas that you're like, I don't think I can add to this because it's, too loaded or something and there's the ones that you find that you're like it's already really perfect <laughs> like it's just a balloon that washed up on the beach but it's incredible so it's partly like the eye you know and and finding something that has enough of a story um i i source things like in a really crazy way i mean it just and i mean that it's like very scattershot at times but I use also a lot of family heirlooms. So um, those can be the ones that are really, really heavy, like um, not physically, but like mm -hmm. sort of intellectually or emotionally or story-wise. And like, I think those are the ones, the things that often stump me the most are the things that actually have a huge um, history and 
and relationship. Um, and it's easier to take, you know, this pile of string that someone dropped off at your doorstep because like Nick, I get deliveries, but I get more like string and bottle caps and stuff. <laughs> um, and if it, there's, you know, I, I like to look at this spectrum of like, uh, things that are so common that everyone has a relationship with them are like neutral almost. And it's the way that, you know, thinking about someone who walks into a store and buys a canvas or paints or even like plasticine or plaster, um, those are like their neutral backgrounds. And those are the things that people just take for granted as part of, of a painting or a sculpture. Um, I think of, for me, it's like, sometimes it's like, oh, everyone understands, has a relationship with styrofoam or everyone has a relationship with clay, even if it's a specific clay to, that I found. Um, and then you start layering on objects that have a bit more meaning, either sentimental or sort of historically. Um, yeah, I don't know. Philly, what do you think? Um, uh uh, Picasso, well, Brock and then Picasso made the first collages um, uh, in a fine art context. You know, they had existed pre previously in Valentine's and things like that, but sort of parlor activities. Um, but, but in an art studio, it was the late summer of 1912. And in um, the first time they showed those, a, um, a symbolist poet wrote a text to go along with the exhibition, um, Isidore Ducasse. And, and he says in the short essay, he says, um, basic, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, uh, but basically found objects might be new in art, but they are already soaked with humanity. And that's like such a beautiful like sentiment to think, um, you know, I, I, I think it's sort of convenient shorthand to imagine that anything, like I don't think there's anything that doesn't have meaning. I think, you know, I think a blank piece of paper has meaning or a, 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 a tube of blue paint has meaning, uh, but the meanings is camouflaged and uh, like very subtle. Um, but uh, the stuff that we all use, like it's already soaked with meaning and, um, and, and, you know, that, that can be so moving to interact with. Um, we had a visiting artist here at Austin P, which is like one of the great, great perks of teaching, uh, you know, which is sort of the greatest job in the world. But uh, we had a, an artist, a Texas artist named Dario Robledo, um, who, uh, you know, is just like, like one of the most brilliant people I've ever heard talk. Um, but he, he, he talked about the fact that he uses found materials um, and he, he said stenciled on the wall of a studio is the question, what do I need to do to earn the, to earn the respect of these materials? Uh, and I really loved that, that, that he like embraced the idea that he wasn't in control of the materials, that he, like he wasn't the master of the situation, um, that he was handing all of this authority to the materials and owed that the materials something. Um, and he uses these really, really pregnant materials, like, um, like he melts down wedding rings that were found on a battlefield by you know, people who have metal detectors. Like there's hardly anything more full of meaning than that. Uh, 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 and, you know, th thinking about that, uh, like has been a real lesson for me. How do the materials get to you, Billy? It's my question. Yeah, so, oh, we we're, like we need to answer your question, right? Uh, so uh, I, I believe this does, isn't really like me, but I believe in love at first sight. And uh, that's uh, falling in love and being a friend and, like all kinds of loves and th that's true of me with materials also it's like we like i'm in a thrift store and our eyes meet across the room and uh like this chemistry happens and i know that i can make something with that or we can make something together me and that you know whatever that thing is uh and uh and i usually know it immediately i, I don't i don't know what the same way like you meet somebody at a dinner party and like you know that you want to like the chemistry's right and you don't know, are they gonna be your best friend or are they gonna like move into the neighborhood? Or are you gonna marry them sometime in the future or whatever? Like, I don't know what I'm gonna make with those things, but I know that the chemistry's right and something will happen. So it's a sense of connection with material. You see it, it speaks to you. 
So the um, utilization of the found object in art is unique in that it not only um, not only are you giving a new voice to the object, but it brings its own voice and story to the work. Yeah. Um, how do you navigate that balance? And while at the same time, give it the respect and acknowledge its own history. I'm gonna open it up to um, any of you. Um, I, for, for me, like first, it's it's acknowledging that its history is valuable. That that uh, I can't make something with it without engaging the history of the image or the history of the material. Um, that it would be irresponsible to not engage it. And and sometimes we're cooperating, and sometimes we're having an argument. Uh, uh, but um, you know, just to ignore that would be irresponsible. It seems. When I go back and forth sometimes, you know, I, the game board that I showed earlier where I had um, uh, sewn on this sequined leviathan eating a sailor on top of this like um, weird kind of Monopoly ripoff. It was like not a Monopoly board, but it was like Monopoly. You know, to me, I, I was combining these two things. I was combining this really beautiful game board that had this, you know, beautiful sort of graphic design on it with this woodcut image um of 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 this leviathan sort of sea serpent and with using the materials of cheap plastic sequins and it's a, like an equation like those three things together kind of have that balance like it is finding a balance everything needs to be equal on each side of the of the equal sign sometimes though i come across that image and like i like we talked about earlier sometimes you don't know what to do with that object and maybe the object is already perfect and you know that gives all the more credence to like the idea of the ready-made like sometimes you find something that's ready-made and it's done you know um but sometimes it just needs a, a little bit of um polishing too like uh like there are some game boards where i just cover up the design of the board with the sequence so then i don't add a new image to it i just add this material to the imagery that's already there and that is enough of a balance to make a new object in a way because I think the other, the X factor, talking about this as an, an, an equation, right? The X factor, the one thing that you can't control in, a, in a, a really good way is the viewer, right? The recipient of this information, what they bring to it. Have they played this game before? Have they worked with sequence before? Are they familiar with these images? Um, and and that's that's something that like, I think about what, 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 what Julia was saying, like some of the, the objects that she uses, bottle caps, strings, things that are, things that you get um, from the scrap exchange that were going to a landfill. Like they're not even thrift store. You didn't, you, people don't even want to buy these things. They want to throw them away and being able to, to show those back to people in a, in a, in a gallery setting and say, no, I don't like, this is something that, you, that, that everybody throws away, but it has, you know, value as an art object as value as a con something to contemplate and think about. Um, that's another type of balance, a balance between you and the viewer and the object is like the fulc fulcrum of that balance and trying to get people to rethink about some of those objects too. Totally. I, I was going to say that I think it's really important to, to not necessarily expect that anyone's going to get a particular thing out of an object. Um, and that there is this kind of like way that you can use an object that it'll make someone look at it in a new way, but you're not beating them over the head with the meaning. Um, and I feel like that's always a balance I'm trying to strike where I'm like interested in the material process. I'm interested in, you know, a lot of references to folk art and, and craft and, um, historical sculpture um, but I want the objects to kind of like jump out of their context in a way that you know they maybe they're abstracted slightly um, and the it, one thing that happened last week I think they announced that now the weight of everything man-made on earth is like outweighs 
all natural materials on earth, like all biological material, which was something that I found, I mean, I, I guess I thought it would happen sooner, but it's pretty shocking when you think about it. And so the fact that we're like now tipping into this point where, I mean, it probably doesn't have the same mass, but like if you're technically more of what we see is a, is a manufactured object every single day, I'd say that's probably true for most people. Um, so thinking about how you can like kind of snap those things into a new context and, and trust the viewer, like Nick's saying, like you don't know where folks are coming from and you kind of have to like, for me, it's often coming with a specific um, story that I don't, I almost never disclose um, to the viewer because I don't think that's important. And I think if you make something like with an intention towards a story or towards a narrative, and you, you don't have to disclose it, but people will read in something to it and see that it was purposeful. J Julia, one thing that I, um, I love about your work in the context of, or one of your projects in the context of this conversation, like we've, we've talked about the materials having meaning um, and the, um, the um, radical repair project of yours, like that in introduces the idea that the action has meaning. Uh, and it's an action that obviously, you know, that comes out of necessity and that existed long before um, you conceived of it as, um, you know, a, you know, as an art process, an mm -hmm. art process. Um, but I think that's really beautiful, like this reminder that behavior is meaningful in, in the studio, not just the product. Totally. And I think that's a good point between all of our works is that we're all doing these kind of obsessive processes and I've helped Nick in his studio and it's slow going and it, he really like you know you're you're really connecting with the materiality of the object and and I think that the process shows through on in all of our works you know be it like a really overgrown basket be it a really detailed collage be it a really like um you know, obsessive embroidery. Um, like, I think you're right. I think the process and transforming an object through maybe a process that it, or a material that it's not typically going through um, can be another way to highlight its, its narrative or its functionality. And then Julia, you talk about your work in terms of uh, sculptural intervention or, or you interrogate the material and make him do which is which which are, to me is is interesting describing that approach towards towards um you know working with material and, and and on the same breath as well when nick you talk about the fulcrum in terms of how much you actually sway the pen, pendulum in terms of exposing meaning to your audience how much of that do you feel you want to actually have a hand in versus opening it up to an audience who has a larger interpretation of, of what's having of, of what's happening because again depending on, on where you're from the location some of these materials may be foreign to someone else who's not familiar with something you know i i think i can say like just bouncing off it, what Julia just talked about and interrelated to what you're asking Heinrich like my studio process isn't fun for me like I don't I don't enjoy necessarily Never. it should be fun just well no, so, so so I I you know when I'm stitching where I'm poking in these holes and stitching it's it's labor you know it's 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 mm -hmm. it's 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 monotonous so then why do I do it right like why do I do this thing because I have two things I I desire to see this object when it's done like I want to see it completed you know I want to see this object, I want to see a, a game board filled with sequins. I need to see that. I need to see it. But the, the object of do, the, the act of doing it isn't necessarily enjoyable. The second reason I make art is to have conversations with people like this. This is the reason why I make art, right? Like the object is just, it's a vessel. It's a vessel for me to have conversations with people. And I, as an artist, and I think a lot of artists feel this way too, I really don't like small talk. I don't like small talk because it's small talk is just saying things that we already, we ask questions we already know the answer to, right? Like, how you doing? Oh, I'm good. How are you? I'm good. Like, and I, I so I don't want my artwork. If I want my artwork to be a conversation, I don't want it to be that conversation. Right. Um, <clears throat> so I really hope that people do bring responses to my artwork that I didn't think they would 
when they see something and they say, well, did you think about this when you were doing it? I'm like, no, but that is brilliant. Like, that, that is really great. You know, can we talk about that? Can we talk about why you had that response that way? And, and, and that's when I feel like that I, I don't want, <clears throat> again, if I'm working with the material and the material is asking me a riddle, I, I want to solve it for myself, but I want to repurpose it into the world as a new riddle for somebody else to look at and then solve in their own way. And then they, when they talk about that piece with somebody else, that's a new conversation that happens too. So, um, I, you know, I, I'm, it's not, you know, I think that it's, a, again, it's a really fine line between saying that I don't, I will never say that I don't care what the viewer thinks. Like there's, there's always a, you know, you might hear an artist say, well, it doesn't matter to me what the viewer thinks. It totally matters to me what the viewer thinks. That's why I make art. But it, they don't have to think what I thought they were going to think, I think, is a, a, me saying something in a very strange way that I hope makes sense. But like, I hope that they bring, I hope they answer my question in a way that surprises both of us. Yeah, I, I, um, I, I sometimes I'll have a student, I'll, t I'll talk to a student about what the work means to me, their work. Uh, what what I think it's saying to me, and they'll say, "But no, no, that's that's not what that's not what I intended." And my, my response is always, "And hooray for that!" Because the the work often has like so much bigger ambitions than our small intentions for it. And it, you know, the work is capable of having conversations with people that we didn't under that we didn't um, expect, and that's like perfect. Julia, anything to add to that? <laughs> Uh, I think the labor piece is really important. I think the, um, you know, kind of going back to why we all make very obsessive choices in our work is is to to show our hand a little bit. Um, and I think, I think again, that's another way of connecting to an audience is kind of bringing up processes or actions or material choices or, um, you know, dot, 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 that it starts to, to divorce the object from itself. And so by, you know, slicing or weaving or stitching, you're kind of, I think, sh I, I keep wanting to say, show your hand, and that really is what it is. And it's kind of like thinking about, you know, for me, I always think, through that process how much work that must have been and then it also takes me to a place where i'm like oh how did that object become itself to begin with you know how does the sequin get made and kind of henrik like what you were talking about in the beginning is like we're looking we're like always shopping the world as as gatherers hunter gatherers of materials and so you know as an artist who also loves to look at art and talk about art i appreciate seeing other people's approaches to the labor side. And I'm always picking apart how things in the world are made. Um, and I, I don't even, you know, it's like, we don't even know that's how we filter things until I, I'll go on a walk with my brother and I'm like, oh, look at that weird brick wall. Like, do you think that's stacked? Or do you think that has mortar? Or do you think like, is it being held in from behind? Or like, you know, and he's just like, I really don't know or care. <laughs> So it's kind of, you know, for me, I'm like, let's explode some of that labor in order to like, to engage. I think when you do it with an unusual material, it starts to make people look at it more than if you are doing it with the expected materials, I guess is what I'm saying. Well, and labor is a, that labor is a kind of value. Like that's a, that's a way that you communicate that something is important. Uh, you know, like, like copying out the entire entire Old Testament by hand, or you know that they would do that because they valued that text, and um, I think that's what all of us are communicating to viewers um, that th th making this object is worth the amount of trouble. <laughs> well, you guys do amazing work, I must say, and also as educators, um, has teaching at craft schools or in academia impacted your own studio practice and this is for me I'm, I'm totally curious about this can you introduce us a little on how you integrate what you've talked about today in into um workshops that you teach 
I can start this one off because I just had this mental image flash up. Whenever I start a workshop, I just, I bring so much stuff. Nick can really attest to this. <laughs> and luckily, like when I'm teaching Aramon, I can drive. So that's pretty easy. I'll fill my truck up. But I also, um, one thing I really like to communicate to students is that you don't have to shop for materials. And so one way I incorporate what I care about into my workshops is I force people to look for things around campus or around town. So the last two summers ago when I taught um, a class, I, we went on a walk and I made everyone pick up like a collection of objects that they, you know, that we found in downtown Gatlinburg. So that's obviously like a really specific hyper commercial zone, like hyper touristic. Um, and I think at first people were like, what am I going to find here? And then, you know, slowly but surely we're finding weird little bits of netting or, you know, a collection of interesting natural objects or whatever. And so part of how I break down that relationship to material in a class is I really just force students to, to collect. And I think, you know, people feel really safe when they have control over what, what they bring to an art project, especially folks with less experience. It's like, oh, I couldn't make something with a non-art material. I can barely make something with an art material. It, it's actually really freeing to like, realize that something with no little or no value something that is trash or that is collected um you can make into something pretty and so or it doesn't even have to be pretty interesting you know thought-provoking um so i think the a huge way that i do that is just i bring a lot of stuff that's weird and i i it's a free-for-all i'm like you can have whatever you want you can i want people to take stuff home because you'll you'll see the class like separate into these different categories where they're like oh i'm so into like used chip bags or oh i'm so into this yarn tangle that we found in the kids closet like whatever um and then to touch on the question of how it how teaching um as for me influences my practice it's just it's like ever informing how I look at things. You know, students ask you the weirdest questions that you're not prepared for and you have to say, I don't know, like, let's look it up. Let's go to the library. Let's, you know, let's call someone. Let's do some research. Um, and it also really makes sure I know certain things. Like, I think I know how to weave until I'm trying to teach it in front of 15 people. And so it, it both reinforces skills I have and it it keeps me really, really humble and curious because students bring up so much unexpected and unexpected stuff in the classroom. Really? Uh, uh, when we pivoted online uh, at the university last March, uh, I, I was able to say, I, I teach a class in collage and they had knives and scissors and glue and uh, Bristol board. Um, and I was able to say, you know, I've got half a semester's worth of assignments that I'm going to give you, and you can do every single one of those without leaving your house. That there is stuff in your house that you can use to satisfy, um, to sa satisfy what I'm going to ask you to do. And um, it, like, being able to say that made it clear to me how so, sort of radically democratic what we do is. That that it doesn't depend on a lot of money or a lot of space or like there's not any like you can you can do what we do like out of anything <laughs> and uh like you know as long as is is you're finding things that you have uh you know some resonant relationship to um in general teaching uh, also i i would echo what julia said which is that it keeps me humble that like I'm faced with questions all day, every day that I don't have a confident answer to. Um, and uh, and it also reminds me like to pay attention to the right things. Like, oh yeah, like that, like I should pay attention to color that way. You know, the way that I've just had to explain it to a student. And it's sort of been running in the background, but teaching like pushes it all to the foreground pretty often. And I think that makes my work a lot better. 
I know for me, uh, uh, I can think of one specific uh, instance where teaching affected my studio practice. You know, I opened up to some of the images that I showed today of those photographs that have stitching on them. That's a fairly recent body of work that I started doing. And I did it because um, I taught a class at Penland uh, School of Craft and I taught it kind of, again, I was brought in um, late in the game. There was a, a photographer who did stitching on, on photographs and they had to cancel their workshop. So I was asked to come in because I had taught stitching on paper there before. And, and, I, and I let Leslie know, I was like, Leslie, you know, um, I'm not a photographer. I don't feel at all confident teaching photography, uh, but I, I, I can print things off of a computer and people have their cell phones. I'm not going to teach them how to take a photograph, but I will we will use photographs as substrates for, for stitching into. And, and so I had to come up with all these new assignments that I didn't typically have in my previous classes um, because I was thinking about photographs. I was thinking about what it means to take a photograph and kind of going deep into a little bit like not deep, but kind of surface like photography uh, theory. And you know, I kind of made these assignments based on portraits and landscapes. And I had never, if my work before then, I never used a, a human figure in my work. I, you know, all the stuff I would stitch into would be maps or I would use a lot of text. But just because I, I do believe that like you, you do the same assignments as your students, right? Like you, you, you challenge yourself. And so I'm, I was doing the same assignments and I was like challenging them like, hey, uh, I want uh, the assignment was to think about spirit photography and, 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 and you know, think about altering the figure with spirit photography. And when I was doing it, I'm like, wow, this is really fun. Like, I really enjoy my own assignment. But then what surprised me, I didn't think anything about it, but I was, would post it on Instagram or show people and people really responded to it. It made me realize that how much power the human figure has as an image that I hadn't really touched upon before. And, um, you know, I feel in the same way that Billy said, I feel humble to even to sort of do those things. But that was a, a body of work that I did because I was challenging myself to do the same assignments that I was giving my students. And at the same time, the, the flip side of that, like I, when I bring sort of my energy, like I taught drawing for a number of years in, in a college, going back to teach the, 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 my initial undergrad degree, I wanted to bring to drawing the same excitement that I found in using a bunch of materials. And we brought this up several times today, but a blank sheet of paper, a brand new set of Prismacolor pencils, and an open tube of paint, all those things are really intimidating because they're new and they're blank and you don't know what to do with them. Again, I think it's a, a lot of the times it's a lot easier to fix a mistake than to do something new. You yeah. know, if I can repair, if I can look at something, I'm like, I know what the problem is here, I can fix it. That's a lot easier than I don't know where to begin. So an assignment that I would do with my drawing classes is, you know, I'd give them a materials list of all this, like go get a bottle of India ink, go, go get a, a nice set of Prismacolor pencils, go get some chalk pastels. And the first day I would tell them to open up all of their things and use all of them on one drawing. So that way there was no unopened thing in their box of materials that hadn't been used. And once they, they, they broke the materials in and th you already messed up, you already, you already, you already snapped your new pastel in half. Like you're, you can't, you can't break it anymore. You get more comfortable with it. You know, you get more comfortable with, with that materials. And that's when I think a lot of art making begins to happen is if you're, if you're too nervous uh, to use your materials, sometimes you, you miss some of that creative response. And so I try to, I try to instill that because I feel the same way when I'm using old thrown out things like well I can't mess this up anymore I mean it's, it was thrown away so I can't really mess it up any more than it already is you know like and that gives you a sort of a liberty and and a creative freedom to explore things you might not have explored before so that's that's a good lead into the next question I have for you guys um is what advice do you have for makers who are trying to introduce found objects into their practice also, responsibility, accountability with that choice and how you use it in terms of appropriation and sustainability. To paraphrase <laughs> Jeff Goldblum quote, you're so preoccupied whether or not they could, they didn't stop to think whether or not they could. I really appreciate the Jurassic Park tie-in, Heinrich. <laughs> Who marks for you on that? <laughs> Um, 
One thing that I find really helpful for folks who are just starting to add found objects um, is to create some parameters. So for me, it might be like, I'm going to use up everything in this box. I'm going to, and it, and it equalizes the playing field in terms of what I'm looking at. So an example of that, there's a sculpture that I made that is it, it was kind of like that one in the slideshow that was the chair with all the wood um, glued up over it, but it was a different chair and I, I glued all of my junk, studio junk that I just didn't know what to do with together to form kind of a self portrait. So for, for me, it's helpful to have a parameter, like I'm going to use glue, I'm going to use up all of these objects, and I'm going to, you know, try to form a shell. Um, and another thing that for me is a, is pretty central to my practice is repetition and, and quantity. And I think that, you know, I think found object work, if you're too precious and you're like, oh, this real, this object is the most important thing. So I'm going to like make it really central and then I'm going to do all these little fussy things around the edges. For me, I find that very hard to pull off. Like if you're trying to make something that is, is like focused on one thing and that, you know, if that, if that thing doesn't look just right, then it's not going to feel good. Um, I find that very difficult. So I, I often for newbies, particularly, I'm like, go big, like use way more things than you thought you would, because I think that points at excess and it points at consumerism and it points at these different themes that you don't have to then say by being like, well, see, I used this, these five bottle caps. So like, don't you get it? It's like, let the objects kind of do the work for you where it's like, if you want to talk about excessive something, you know, just go crazy, like push it way past what you're even comfortable with. Um, I'm really, I'm really hesitant to be labeled an environmental artist because I think that that like has a lot of baggage and I think it, it, it puts some pressure on like being pious in your whole life. And it's like, oh, I do my best, but I don't, you know, I don't have a closed loop in my studio by any means, or, you know, it's, I do throw things away. Um, so I think talking about sustainability and how that functions in, I don't think, I think another thing is to let go of some guilt where it's like, it's okay to like have something not work out and have to throw it out. You know, I think there's like, um, there's a conscientiousness that that's present in the work, but you don't have to be, you know, totally prostrate to the process of, of salvaging things. Uh, I, I, I want to echo uh, something that Julia said, which is, um, you know, a, a lot of art students stop making artwork when they finish school. It, it, and I'm convinced that it's, um, it's because they did not learn how to give themselves an assignment. And I think that's the key to making work, uh, like to set some parameters for what you're, you're going to do. And it doesn't really matter what those parameters are. Um, like once you get started and you're being responsive uh, to the work, it, like it doesn't matter, but you have to set it, like if you give yourself some rules, a, a work can come out of it. Um, yeah, you know, I think um, as we talked about when we come across images that are just so wonderful on their own, and you don't know what to do with, you know, when, when I, since I'm reusing a lot of images, I'm reusing a lot of text, you know, those, how people respond to those, that has meaning. And I, I, util, I utilize in my work a lot, if you go to my website, if people are familiar with my work, I use the imagery and the font of the Ouija board a lot. Um, and that's a really loaded image for a lot of people. And what's interesting about a Ouija board is that um, people tend to have one of two reactions to it, which is that it's um, this goofy um, slumber party game that they did when they were a kid and, and they, they, they laughed about it, or it's a really dangerous occult object, you know? Um, and what I try to do, and again, like I make work because I like having conversations with people. It doesn't even have to be about my work. It just has to be about what my work's about, like my interests. And so I would encourage people, if they're wanting to use found objects, well, first of all, use found objects that you're, you want to have conversations about, you know, like if you don't enjoy doing the research, if like somebody questions you about like, well, do you know why you're using this, you know, reference to, I don't know, what, whatever, uh, 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 another, uh, an art historical form or something like that. And, 
you start to do the reading and you're not interested in that at all, that's not what you should make your work about, right? You should make work about where you're excited to do the research as much as you're excited to do the work. You're excited to have conversations about these topics, even if, if a lot of the times um, those conversations make you feel uncomfortable or sometimes people don't like what you do, but they're still willing to talk to you about it. That, that's still a conversation, you know, and that conversation is important because it's going to help you understand your topics and your imagery better. It's going to make it so, and I, that's, like I said, I love that. I, you know, when I give an artist lecture about my work and then people come up afterwards and tell me about the time that they were a kid and they used a Ouija board or the time that they saw a UFO or the time that they saw a ghost. <laughs> that's why, that's why I make the work that I do is to have those conversations. And I have to do that with an open mind. It doesn't matter if I believe Ouija boards work or not. It doesn't matter if I believe that ghosts are real. I believe that these things are important to us as, as, as people in our human experience. And I want to have those conversations. So I would just say like, there's always, I think all three of us here, when you find a found, a found object that you want to use, there is that, as Billy brought up, I'm going to bring it back up again. There's an infatuation sometimes with the object right away. Sometimes infatuations though don't always work out, right? Like infatuations are what they are. They're infatuations. And it's fine to experiment and explore like using a material, but, if after a while you realize that the material doesn't give you a deeper connection with the material or deeper conversations, it's okay to not use it anymore. You, you experiment, you learn from it, you, you have that experience, but really find that material, that process, that technique, that object that you're excited to like learn more about. Even if you're not making objects from it, you're just, you like reading about it. So much to talk about, so little time. <laughs> I'm going to move on to um, the Q&A with time management because I'm sure we can go on talking about so much of what we've been covering today. Questions that are coming out uh, and one of the questions here is, is a, a two-part question. Where do you think lost things go? I'm not sure if that's directed to Nick, but... Um, Second part of the question is, what materials or images should stay lost? Any of you? Well, <laughs> those are like existential questions. I, wasn't... <laughs> I didn't come up with them. <laughs> I thought they were, they were interesting oh. questions that, that adds to the puzzle. I mean, I guess in the face of our racial reckoning in this country right now, I think like images of Confederate soldiers and, you know, racist propaganda, like should be probably stored away pretty much for good. I mean, I think there's some imagery um, and objects that are related to mass oppression and, um, you know, white supremacy and patriarchy that like could just go away forever and, and, and need to be known sort of historically so that we don't revisit those topics as a, as a society. But I just, I mean, I often, I feel like a lot of, there are artists that grapple with really loaded imagery, um, Confederate flags and, um, and the like. And, and sometimes I think it's done well. And sometimes it's like, you know, we don't need to like re-glorify this object. Um, I would say some of that could be lost forever, <laughs> personally. You know, sometimes I think about, you know, as long as, you know, human history has been so expansive, but we have such a small amount of recorded history. You know, sometimes I, 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 I'm always, it, it, it makes me sad. It makes me depressed to think about a poem that will never get read. You know, I know that sounds kind of romantic for me to say that, but like, um, so I don't know if, you know, I don't know if anything should remain lost forever. And even to, to Julia's point, like what Julia mentioned, like even the things that are parts of human history that are not the best parts of human history, I'm always afraid we're gonna doom, we're gonna be doomed to repeat those if we don't you know, look at them closely at the same time. But at the same time, as Julia mentioned, it's so important to think about how, how, how careful we use those things. Um, so, you know, I know that things will get, there are things that will get lost. I think about, and Billy's example of the, 
the the artist who use, reuses the wedding rings from battlefields you know think about that like those rings were not probably going to be found um, and by finding them there's a whole narrative there that is poignant you know so you know i think about the things that are buried deep down and will never be found or brought to light and there's a part of me that I want to, I want to see it. You know, I want to, I want to look into the void, you know, I want to, I want to find those Leviathans that are deep under the sea, you know, even if, even if what they show us isn't pretty. I am, I, uh, I, I spent a while thinking about the title of the, the, this event, um, because I don't think of myself as working with lost things. And, and I was interested, Heinrich, when you like reconfigured the question, question about like when none of us answered it but like a time when we were lost uh uh because i because i think of my the stuff i work with like lost implies that it's to me implies that it's been sort of misplaced like my glasses always uh it but instead i think they like these things just have sort of like gone somewhere unexpected ra rather than misplaced so even those wedding rings like waiting under the ground at Gettysburg or whatever. Like, I don't think of them as lost. I think of them as, I don't know, dormant or, um, uh, you know, in um, uh, like sequestered or, but, but not so much lost. Um, but in terms of my, like my own work, you know, I, I just try to make work that I think I have some authority to address, about ideas that I have some authority to address. Uh, address, um, you know, about being in love or about experiencing grief. Um, and I, I don't so much feel like I have, like it's my place to be prescriptive about what other people make artwork about. Um, like I just leave that to them. And there are things I wouldn't make work about, but it's because I don't have the authority to speak about those things. Um, uh include one other question again that was asked so during especially during now um during the time of covid um have you been able to safely source for art materials right now this is when like I've completely turned my house upside down to reuse everything that I can. Like uh, I'll show, like, I don't, I'm in a point in my work where I just finished up a bunch of pieces. So I'm kind of at that juncture point when I can make new pieces, but I don't really know what to make. I have a bin of just ephemera that I just keep and I just went through it. And I, and I think we've talked about this, giving yourself like just a, a structure. I've just been cutting eight by eight inch squares of paper. I don't know what I'm going to do with these papers yet. I mean, they're pictures, they're text but it gives me something to do. And I just look at the stack getting, I've also got a six by six inch square stack of paper. I have no idea what I'm gonna do with these, but this, the stack gets bigger every day. And they're all things that I've had in my house, in, my, in this bin for months or years, that they, they were just set there. And to use Billy's word, they were, it, they were dormant. They were sequestered, they were sitting there, and now I'm finding them again in my own house. So, yeah, do I miss going into a thrift store? Oh man, so much. So much do I miss walking through and just being able to to buy things and touch things. At the same time, being in this pandemic has forced me to look at my own immediate surroundings with a little bit more focus and attention. And that's been great. That's been, you know, that's been something that has invigorated my studio practice. Absolutely. I echo that. I've done a deep dive into my studio, which is in my basement and my house. Um, I did help my dad move, so I got some weird stuff out of that. But um, I, for the Radical Repair Workshop, I started a, a series. I got some funding from the American uh, or from the Craft Center in Asheville um, to do just that with other people, like have them look for something in their house that needed repair, um, particularly folks who are really homebound. Um, and like things that we live with every day that are broken or objects that we could repurpose, um, just looking around. So it's been, I, I actually found it kind of like a relief to not be accumulating a lot more stuff. Cause I, especially when I'm teaching, I have this tendency to just like get so much stuff and then I have all this, you know, 
stuff I eventually have to deal with. So it's been, yeah, similarly very interesting um, to work just from my very comprehensive stash. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's the same for me. I've been collecting class materials since 1982. Okay. And I, I have, I have, tens of thousands of pieces of paper. Like I could work the rest of my life and not bring anything new into the studio and, and not use it all up, so. And that's kind of hard when, you know, as authors and, and collectors, you keep gathering up our art material, um, you know, and boxes and boxes, room, room fulls of them will never be enough. Um, and, and, you know, Nick, I think it's, it's, it's really interesting that, especially for a lot of us now, when, you know, some limit and restriction in terms of, of gathering a material, um, how does that, you know, put us back in a position of having to re reevaluate uh, our perspective on, on how we create with what we have? Um, and, and, you know, we tend to overlook on, on what's in front of us and we always look beyond in terms of what's up there um so it's 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 fascinating the amount of possibility out there in terms of of what we can achieve with just what we have um i think that presents a, a sense of res resilience of of creating you know um what's what's what we first start up to actually achieve with just the most basic of material that's within our reach. Well, thank you all so much for joining us for this conversation. Heinrich, this was great. Thank you so much for guiding everyone through this panel. Um, just sitting on the back for the first time, it was so fun to listen to everyone's conversation. It was really great. Um, so later this week, check back in on our website and our YouTube channel because this recording will go up um, for the folks at home to watch. Um, and on, on behalf of everyone here at Aramont, have a safe and happy holiday and stay creative out there, y'all. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Keep making work and stay inspired. Bye. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.